for most of the more. So before starting uh, our uh, seminar today, let's resort the Fatiha. It can stop. Yes, what's wrong? Nampak tak slide? Nampak tak? Nampak eh? Okay, can we start? Okay, so uh, Sumia Rahman uh, I'm going to present uh, this seminar today regarding the neonatal jaundice. Okay, so this is my outline for the um, seminar today. So first, we're going to go to the definition of jaundice. Uh, second, uh, we will go to the bilirubin metabolism. And later, we're going to uh, go to the approach to the neonatal jaundice. Uh, we will go to the history, uh, physical examination, investigation, as well as management. I cannot see the slides. Okay, so first, uh, what is jaundice? Uh, jaundice uh, can be defined uh, as the yellowish situation of uh, sclera, skin, and mucous membrane uh, due to the elevation of the serum bilirubin. You check, Kasyaira. Akak, you check, you check. Yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Can you see the slide? Uh, I can see now. Okay, yes, okay. now I can okay. see. Hello. Yeah. Saya nak ada background noise. 
Okay. okay, so um, jaundice can be 85 micromol per liter or equal to 5 milligram per deciliter. Background noise. Okay, uh, bilirubin metabolism. So uh, for the bilirubin metabolism, uh, first uh, hemoglobin is a uh, breakdown uh, into the uh, unconjugated uh, bilirubin. Uh, this unconjugated is BP. Uh, so this uh, unconjugated bilirubin will bind to the albumin uh, and then uh, uh, it will be taken out by the liver. So in the liver, uh, this uh, bilirubin will conjugate with the uh, glucuronyl transferase enzyme and become conjugated bilirubin. So this conjugated bilirubin is actually uh, water soluble. Um, and then this uh, bilirubin will excrete in by uh, into the gut. Uh, so it will be a uh, stecobinogen in uh, stool and urobinogen However, um, if the unconjugated bilirubin uh, exceed the albumin binding capacity, it can cross a uh, blood brain barrier, um, it can cross the clinic okay. uh, I think the bilirubin metabolism, uh, we need to show it okay, more, so this more details. Type of bilirubin. We have two types. We have um, uh, Shahira. For bilirubin metabolism, we need uh, to yes. go in more detail. Yeah, we need to show more detail at the bilirubin metabolism because you made it uh, simplified. Yeah. So uh, let's see it in detail. Mm -hmm. Bilirubin metabolism is important, very important. So I want you to know in detail. Okay. No more bilirubin. Um, I think, um, the the and so this goes to the amino acid bowl. Amino acid bowl. And here goes to heme oxygenase. Heme oxygenase. Heme oxygenase will give us deliver D. Then we have what is the name of the enzyme? Deliver D. Reductase. Very good. Reductase will give us bilirubin. So this bilirubin is unconjugated. This bilirubin is unconjugated. Unconjugated or indirect. Unconjugated or indirect. So it is lipid soluble. It binds to albumin. It binds to albumin. Bind this to albumin. Then it goes to the liver. By the blood circulation, it goes to the liver. So in the liver, we have four steps. In the liver, we have four steps. Binding, uptake, conjugation, and excretion. So, binding to the receptors, uptake inside, conjugation with the enzyme, uridine, diphosphate, glucuronyl transferase. Glucuronyl transferase. That is the name of the enzyme. So, Bilirubin becomes conjugated. Bilirubin becomes conjugated and excreted. After excretion here, when it reaches the intestine, when it reaches the small intestine, 
it will not stay conjugated. So what bilirubin is see here is not conjugated. There will there is enzyme intestinal deconjugase. Intestinal deconjugase. D conjugase. This intestinal deconjugase will make bilirubin again unconjugated. So it became conjugated here. But after the spinal deconjugate, it became unconjugated. It became unconjugated. The other thing can make the conjugation is bacteria. Bacteria also can act and make the conjugation of bilirubin. The bilirubin, which is released here now, it goes for enterohepatic circulation. The unconjugated goes for enterohepatic circulation. Entero enterohepatic circulation and the one which does not go to enterohepatic circulation becomes urobilinogen by action of bacteria urobilinogen and then goes to the kidney becomes urobilin urobilin the part which does not go to the kidney it goes down and becomes stercobilinogen stercobilinogen and this stercobilinogen becomes stercobilin in a stool. So we need to know it in detail. Is it clear for everyone? Yes, doctor. Okay. Doctor. Okay. Okay. Continue, Shaira. Hello, no pata. No pata. No pata. No pata. No pata. No
Uh, uh, Doctor, uh, can you please uh, open uh, at my computer? I cannot share the uh, slide. So, uh, cannot share the slide. So, I ask help for Shazam. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, ask him. I've already asked Asha Zani for help to screen the slide. Okay, you, 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 you share the slides and okay, fine. Can everyone see the slide? Everyone can see the slide? Yes, yes, Wani. Yes. We can see the slide. Okay. Yes. okay. So next, uh, uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, uh, for the types of bilirubin, uh, previous slide. Okay, so uh, okay, so this is the types of bilirubin. Uh, we have two types. Uh, we have unconjugated bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin. So uh, for the unconjugated, uh, it can bind to albumin, and for the for the conjugated, uh, it is conjugated with the glucuronic uh, acid in the liver. And then uh, for the unconjugated, it's a lipid soluble. Uh, for the conjugated, it's a water soluble. And for unconjugated, it can cause blood brain barrier. And for conjugated, uh, can be excreted in urine and stool. Um, and unconjugated, uh, it can cause brain toxicity. Uh, and for the conjugated, it's not toxic. Uh, next. What do we call the toxicity in the brain? Pernicterus. Very good. Which part of the brain? Um, which part of the brain is affected by kernicterus? Yes, basal ganglia. Basal ganglia and the brain stem nuclei. So first basal ganglia, after that brain stem nuclei. Very good. Carry on. Phoenix. Okay, so this is the causes of the neutral jaundice. You can divide it uh, into three. Uh, jaundice starting at the less than 24 hours of life. Uh, jaundice at 24 hours to two weeks of uh, age. And jaundice at more than two weeks of age. So for the uh, jaundice that's starting less than 24 hours uh, of life. So it can be caused by the hemolytic disorder. Uh, such as uh, recess uh, incompatibility. Uh, ABO group incompatibility. Recess speed deficiency. And as well as spherocytosis. Uh, but the most common is the ABO in incompatibility. And second cause is the congenital infection, like torches. And then um, second jaundice at 24 hours to two weeks of age, uh, may be caused by the physiological jaundice, uh, breast milk jaundice, septicemia, hemolysis, and as well as polycythemia. And then for the jaundice at more than two weeks of age, can be divided into two, unconjugated and conjugated. So for the unconjugated, it can be caused by the breast milk jaundice, uh, septicemia, uh, infection, hypothyroid, and as well as hematic anemia. So for the conjugated, it can be caused by the uh, bilirubin atresia, cholidocalcis, congenital infection, inborn error metabolism, and as well as tenetal hepatitis. Okay, so uh, jaundice can be classified into two. Uh, unconjugated and conjugated. So for the unconjugated, uh, we have uh, physiological and pathological. So pathological, we have hemolytic and non-hemolytic. Uh, under hemolytic, uh, can be caused by hereditary spherocytosis, sickle cell disease, and as well as thalassemia. For the non-hemolytic cause, uh, it is uh, breast milk jaundice, sepsis, and hypothyroid. For the conjugated, we can 
divided into hepatic and post hepatic causes. Um, hepatic cause um, can be caused by the touch infection and also escalate to senior. And for the post hepatic cause, um, the atresia and polydiagnosis. Okay, Shahira, I will ask you here. So, in the hemolytic causes, yes. you put a sickle cell disease. I don't know what which reference to do that sickle cell disease can cause hemolytic jaundice. Because as I know, sickle cell disease, yes, it is one of the causes of jaundice, but it doesn't cause a neonatal jaundice. So this one, it is better you cancel it. I took it out from internet. You take it from the oh. internet. Which part? Oh, okay. You know, it is open for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I prefer you cancel it. And when you say thalassemia, which thalassemia you talk about? Which thalassemia can cause in little jaundice? Which thalassemia? It is unusual also. It is unusual. It may happen sometimes in severe form of hemoglobin H alpha thalassemia. If you have three deleted genes, three deleted alleles. You know, if you have four deleted alleles, the baby will be born with erythroblastosis fetalis. Erythroblastosis fetalis, they will have, they will have uh, this jaundice, erythroblastosis fetalis. If you have four, four deleted alleles, part hemoglobin, we call it part hemoglobin. If you have three deleted alleles, it will be hemoglobin H. It is unusual, it is unusual to cause a uh, neonatal jaundice, but it may happen, it was reported. Yeah. Beta thalassemia never. Beta thalassemia never, never, never cause a neonatal jaundice. So you have to be careful. Better don't mention these things. You mentioned hereditary spherocytosis, yes. You mentioned ABO compatibility, RH incompatibility, yes. But like sickle cell disease and thalassemia, better don't mention. Yeah, so it's better not to Okay, so next. Okay, so uh, for the uh, physiological journalist, uh, usually uh, in the newborn, uh, it can be caused by the bilirubin uh, metabolism is immature due to the liver immaturity uh, for it to be uh, metabolized by the liver and as well as the um, increased bilirubin load on the hepatic cell due to physiological polycythemia. Due to larger circulating red blood cell volume as well as a uh, shortened uh, red blood cell span, in which the unit has a uh, 70 to 90 days uh, red blood cell span compared to adult, which is 120 days. appears between hours of age uh, and then uh, the maximum intensity seen on 4 to 15 hours, uh, yes. usually does not exceed uh, 15 yeah, hours per second. What do you mean uh, between hours of age? Yes. What do you mean by first appears between hours of age? I don't understand. Which hours you mean? Um, I mean uh, more than uh, 24 hours. Must be more than 24 hours because 24 hours is pathological. Usually, physiological jaundice, day two, day three, like that. Day three, typically day three. Day three and uh, disappear by day seven, it will disappear. And it is mild, does not need a treatment. That is the physiological jaundice. Okay, carry on. Okay, so it's a diagnosis of attrition. Instead, we must uh, rule out first other causes and then we can um, diagnose the physiological jaundice and no treatment is required, but uh, the baby should be observed closely if there's a sign of worsening jaundice. Usually, the duration must be less than two weeks for term and three weeks of the term baby. Next. Next slide. Okay. 
So for the uh, pathological jaundice, it's a jaundice on first day of life or at two weeks age, uh, usually pathology. And we can be divided into early jaundice, which is start on the first day of life. And for long pathological jaundice, which is more than 14 days in or more uh, usually the baby will um, present it with uh, uh, or what kind of stool. Uh, why why clay or why kind of stool? Can you tell us why? Hepatosplenomegaly may present and as well as anemia. Uh, third one is a deep jaundice in which um, and usually the bilirubin uh, level will high. Hello. Huh? My doctor was asking doctor why why does the stool become uh, clay colored? What pale colored stool? Why? How why, why does why pale colored stool? Yeah, anyone can answer? Shahira does not know the answer. The question is open. Um, the size of oxide is because, because there's no stercobilinogen. No stercobilinogen, yes. Yeah, because stercobilinogen or stercobilin is the one responsible for the color of the stool, the one responsible for the brown color. If the stercobilin is not there, so the stool will be white. Okay, thanks. Continue. Okay, um, but the, um, this is the differences between the physiological and pathological jaundice. So um, you can see the difference here uh, for the physiological, usually onset after 24 hours of life. And then for the pathological, within 24 hours. And usually the total therapy for pathological uh, rise less than 85 micromole per liter and pathological rise more than 85 micromole per liter. And then for the physiological, maximum intensity is four by four to fifty in term and seven day in term. Uh, and then um, usually the, for the pathological, jaundice persists after two weeks in term or three weeks in preterm unit. And the total therapy for the physiological jaundice is less than two hundred fifty-seven. Pathological is more than two hundred fifty-seven. And for the physiological jaundice, uh, clinically not detectable after two weeks in term and three. With two weeks in preterm, but for the pathological, uh, we have a clean colored stool, dark colored urine, and as a conjugated urine, more than 35 micromole per liter. Okay, so this one is for the pathological jaundice. We can divide it into the unconjugated and conjugated. For the unconjugated, just now is hemolytic and non hemolytic causes, and for the conjugated, we can be divided into obstructive, infectious. Metabolic toxin and autoimmune cause. Okay, this one is for the unconjugated um, pathologic jaundice cause. Uh, for the hemolytic, um, we have um, resist isoimmunization, um, ABO incompatibility, uh, red blood cell enzyme uh, deficiency, red blood cell number defect, hemoglobinopathy, autoimmune hemodynamia. And also um, thought infection. And for the uh, the hemolytic, we have um, physiological jaundice. Um, again, uh, Shahira, Shahira, I will yes. interrupt you again. Here, uh, you are your topic is in neonatal jaundice. So you are mentioning Wilson disease and hemolytic uremic syndrome. We don't see in the neonatal period. We don't see mm -hmm. them. 
يا هيموريت كيرمت سندروم ات از اكوايرد كونديشن ذا انفكشن هو تيل مي باي ويتش اورجانيزم ويتش اورجانيزم كان كوز هيموريت كيرمت سندروم اوبن كوشتو ايكولاي ويتش تايب اوف ايكولاي يس فيري جود او 157 اكس انتيريور ويتش انتيرو كولاي انتيرو Zero hemorrhagic, very good. And what is the source for hemorrhagic pyramid syndrome? What is the food source? The food source, it is acquired condition. Zero hemorrhagic E. coli attacks the bowel, yes. From where, what is the food source? The common food source. Anyone knows? The common food which causes hemorrhagic pyramid syndrome via anterior hemorrhagic E. coli. Is it is it meat, uh, Prof? Yes, meat. Which meat? Which meat? Red, red meat. Yes, which red meat? Hmm, which red meat? I'm not sure, bro. It is hamburger. 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 Oh. Hamburger. So we 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 don't see in the new list. So like this one, you need Wilson disease. You need to remove. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, you need to remove. Uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, also you need to remove. Yeah, and hemoglobinopathy is like I said, thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. We don't expect them to present and generate the unit. Enzyme deficiency, yes. RBC membrane defect, yes. Fan hematoma, yes. Yes, bulletinia, yes. Okay, go to the others. Yes, Shahira, can you continue? Okay. So, uh, next slide. Okay, uh, this one is uh, the comparison for the breastfeeding uh, breast milk jaundice. So, for the uh, breastfeeding jaundice, uh, it's in usually in first week uh, after birth in the breastfeed babies. And uh, Autophysiology usually caused by the uh, insufficient uh, breast milk intake, which can lead to the the um, capillaries and inadequate uh, bowel movement to remove the baby um, from the body. So this will increase the internal hepatic circulation and increase the reabsorption of bilirubin from the intestine. So usually, uh, can be due to uh, frequent breastfeeding and lactation support for the uh, breast milk jaundice. Usually, uh, occurs within two weeks after birth and lasts for four to thirty weeks. Usually, caused by the uh, increased uh, beta glucose release uh, in breast milk and lead to the increased deconjugation and the absorption of bilirubin. So, make the physiology jaundice persistent. So, the treatment we need to interrupt the breastfeeding of the baby for one to two days and resume back the breastfeeding. And if required, we need uh, to do photo therapy to the baby. Stop here, Shahira. Uh, first, uh, breast milk jaundice, the mechanism uh, it is not known yet. One beta glucuronidase is a theory. It is the circulation of beta glucuronidase, it is a theory. There is another theory also, one substance in the breast milk called uh, pregnant 3 alpha 20 beta diol. That one also uh, inhibit uh, conjugation. And there is another theory of uh bully and saturated fatty acids bully and saturated fatty acids in breast milk uh inhibit conjugation so that's why unconjugated bilirubin increase for the treatment interrupt breastfeeding we don't encourage that please huh? we always encourage breastfeeding that one uh they mentioned that you may do it as diagnostic test as a diagnostic test you stop breastfeeding for one to two days as diagnostic but uh, if you uh, have good experience and you can exclude other pathological causes, don't interrupt the breastfeeding. Don't interrupt. We don't like to interrupt the breastfeeding. You know uh, the problem with the formula. We always, always need to support the breastfeeding. Okay. 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 
So this side is still for the conjugated uh, pathology changes uh, causes, can be the obstructive, the double of the immune, infectious and toxic. For the obstructive, we have the allergen syndrome, uh, biliary atresia, and then um, cholidiasis, cholidiasis, and as well as tumor or neoplasm. And then for the metabolic, we have uh, alcohol antigen insufficiency, galactosemia, tyrosemia, and cystic fibrosis. And then for the uh, autoimmune, we have uh, autoimmune for hepatitis and cystic meningitis. For the infection, we can have uh, viral hepatitis, uh, bacterial sepsis, uh, UTI, urinary tract infection, and also leptospirosis. For the toxic, um, it can give from the total concentration and also can be drug induced. So again, uh, you, are, you are putting some causes which uh, we don't put them to happen in the new unit. Okay, I will ask an uh, open question. Anyone knows what is allergic syndrome? Allergic syndrome. Sorry, Prof. Uh, uh, I don't know. Yes, tell me. Uh, it's actually a genetic disorder um, which can affect, which can cause liver damage. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, cause, uh, the cause is usually by the uh, bile ducts abnormalities. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay. So, what they have outside of the liver, what they have? Pardon? Outside the liver, what other abnormalities they have? What the small features they have? Do they have problem in the vertebrae? Do they have problem in the eyes, in the kidney? Yes, very good. So they have pulmonary artery stenosis in the heart. They have pulmonary artery stenosis. Okay. What they have in the kidney? Um, for the kidney, I'm um, not sure, Prof. I remember the heart disease. And also for the ocular, it's actually the um, the posterior embryotoxone. Very good. Posterior embryotoxone. Okay. Uh, what else? What they have in the vertebra? They have characteristic vertebra. Vertebra. Butterfly vertebrae. Ah, yes. Very good. Butterfly. Butterfly. If you go to Google, search for butterfly vertebra, you will see. The vertebra is like butterfly. The vertebra is like butterfly. So what is the genetic defect in allergic syndrome? What is the genetic defect? Chromosome 20 deletion, Prof. Yes, there is micro deletion. It is micro deletion. It is different when you say deletion or micro deletion. Micro deletion, same like which syndrome cause has a congenital heart disease and hypocalcemia? Oh, a Dijor syndrome. Dijor. Catch 22. Yes, catch 22. It has micro deletion also. So the George has micro deletion. Alagile has micro deletion. The George micro deletion 22. Alagile micro deletion 20. How to diagnose micro deletion? What is the test for micro deletion? Fish, bro. Fish. Fish, fish. yes. So go to fish. Take fish for your lunch today. So you remember uh, the George and Alagile. Prof, may I ask, what's the difference between deletion and micro deletion, Prof? It is in the base pairs, in the base pairs, the size. I'm not sure how uh, how, how long is the the the, the, the deletion uh, space to say micro, but when you say micro deletion, means it is small, small area, small segment. Deletion is larger segment. Okay, thank you, Prof. Okay, welcome. Okay, carry on, Shahira. So this is the risk factor for the severe neonatal jaundice. We have a premature baby, low birth weight, and jaundice in the first 24 hours of life, and mother with blood group O or resist negative. Uh, this is feeding deficiency, uh, rapid rise of total serum bilirubin, sepsis, uh, lactation failure, cephalic hematoma or bruises, and
Okay, so we go to the uh, characters, which is the complication of the uh, uncontributed Dolby that are uh, deposited in the rest of India. So uh, we know that uncontributed Dolby can cause a uh, crack brain barrier. Uh, usually the um, baby can be manifested uh, at the early uh, stage, uh, lethargy, hypotonia, uh, irritability, poor moral response, poor feeding, and also high pitch cry. And for the late um, presentation, um, the baby may have a uh, bulging fontanelle, uh, office uh, tetanus, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, fever, hypotonicity, and as well as seizure. So if uh, we do... Um, okay, I, I will ask one question here. Uh, it is open a question to all. Any abnormal movement you can see when you have carnitrous? Other than the seizures? Choreoapitosis, very good. What else? Any other abnormal movement? Other than choreoapitosis? Mm. The Dystonia. Like what is it? Dystonia. Dystonia. So tell me what the definition of dystonia? Dystonia is... Uh, Involuntary. 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 Verbesless. No. Sustained. Sustained. Twisting. No. Involuntary. Verbesless. No. Sustained. Twisting. This is dystonia. What is the definition of Korea? Involuntary, perspiceless, rapid, yes. slowing, and uh, irregular. Irregular, very irregular. good. Involuntary, perspiceless, rapid, flowing, irregular movement. Very good. Very good. Okay, carry on, Shahira. Okay. So, uh, next. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, this is the features. Uh, features. We can have a clip little bit in the body and also for me, little bit in the body is other name of the features. So for the uh, acute uh, little bit in the body, uh, we have this one, which is the first, first one to do this, in which the baby may have a uh, poor sucking, uh, stupor, hypotonia, and so seizure. And for the phase two, uh, usually of the individual of the phase two, in which the baby may have hypotonia of the extensor muscle. Of his tetanus, tetrapolis, and we have fever. And phase three, after the first week, um, the baby may present with the hypotonia. For the chronic little bit in capability, usually um, in the first year, the baby may have hypotonia, uh, active deep tender reflexes, and also obligatory tonic neck reflexes and delayed photo skin. And after first year, uh, they may have um, abnormal uh, movement disorder, which is the choreo atetosis. Uh, balancement, tremor, and also updated with the upward keys and sensory neural hearingness. Okay, uh, this one is the um, little bit induced uh, neurologic dysfunction, bind score, uh, used uh, to So now uh, we move to the approach to the uh, journeys. So first uh, we have the history in which uh, we must know the age of the onset uh, of the journeys to look whether there's a physiological or pathological journeys. And then uh, next, is it the baby term or preterm baby? And then uh, presence of acute nervous encephalopathy symptoms that we have discussed before. And we also must ask the birth history. Is it a small uh, risk factor for the um, changes, which is a small for population age? Uh, we must ask the maternal blood type and status. Uh, is there any maternal infection, traumatic delivery, or perinatal asphyxia? And as well, we must ask the family history. Uh, any sibling with the changes, clinic stress, is it speed deficiency? Okay, so and then um, this one is the presentation for the uh, hyper 
Pilih begininya, aku cuba tak lagi pilih begininya So usually for the patient, bila aku cuba tak lagi begininya It may have um, feeling pattern, uh, we must ask feeling pattern, type and amount of my intake Present of vomiting and irritability uh, Feeling intolerance The ministry of health care and nurses, this is CD and hemocrimity party uh, We must ask the hard drug history And then small for patient age uh, and also post trauma For the conjugated hyperbilirubinia uh, presentation is a uh, dark urine color and next to uh, jaundice more than two weeks, uh, maternal and parental history, and as well as family history for jaundice, uh, liver disease, or any metabolic disorder. Okay, next we move to the uh, physical examination. So, for the general, we must uh, look for the uh, gestational age gestational weight, uh, in terms of any sign of sepsis and also the hydration status of the baby. And then we look at the face, uh, if there's dysmorphic, etora, and for the eyes, we look if there's any conjectural failure. No, so, uh, if, if the patient has a beaked nose and large ears and micrognathia, what would you think in? Beaked nose, large ears, and micrognathia. What syndrome? Is it, is it yeah. Nunan because of the micrognathia? Is no, it Nunan syndrome? Nunan. Because micrognathia. Not Nunan. Micro it is one syndrome for having jaundice. One syndrome causing inunited jaundice. Just now we were talking about it. Allergy. Allergy syndrome. Yes, allergy syndrome. Allergy syndrome. Yes, allergy. So, beaked nose, they call it bulbous. Bulbous nose, B-U-L-B-O-U-S. Bulbous nose, micrognathia, and large ears. Allergy. Okay? Carry on. Okay. So um for the um, this one is the visual assessment for the jandis. We use the primus rule in which um we look at the area of the body with a uh, yellowish discoloration and then there's a range of cylinder moving. So uh, we can perform it by branching the skin, the slight finger pressure. However, um, usually uh, in the baby of dark skin, it uh, will be difficult to observe. Uh, but this um, assessment is unreliable when on phototherapy. Okay, this one is the sign of the bilirubin encephalopathy. Uh, the, patient, uh, the baby may have a hypotonia or hypotonia uh, seizure of this tetanus is the, like the picture that I've shown, uh, retrocolis and as well as a high pitch cry. So the photo you are showing us, what Bush shirt has? Pardon? So uh, you, you put one photo here, having certain posture. So what is the posture in the photo? Posture of the baby in the photo? The obestotinous posture. Obestotinous, very good. Yeah, so the baby has obestotinous. We can see it. Arching of the back. Arching of the back. Okay, very good. Okay. Carry on. Okay, so for the uh, investigation, we must do the uh, total and direct bilirubin level, and then we must do the blood group analysis for mother and baby. Uh, we must do the full blood count to look for the hemochemotopathy if there's any polycythemia, and then full blood film if we suspect uh, spherocytosis, and then this is for the uh, assay, uh, full test, uh, then we must do a septic blood count. Function test, uh, okay, I, I will interrupt function. you, uh, Sahira. I will ask one yes. question. 
So you said you want to look for full blood filling to look for spherocytosis, spherocytosis. Yes, that's yes. correct. But not only hereditary spherocytosis can cause spherocytes. Other conditions also can cause spherocytes in blood filling. Who will tell me what are the other conditions which can cause spherocytes in blood film? Any HCS? other conditions can cause spherocytes? Mm -hmm. Hemolytic uremic syndrome? Yes. What? Hemolytic uremic syndrome. No. No. Thalassemia? No. How about uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome? No. <laughs> uh, hemolytic anemia? Spherocytes. Condition you see spherocytes. You look at the blood film. You see spherocytes. So number one, hereditary spherocytosis. Number two, malaria infection. No, not malaria. Autoimmune. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Yes, yes. Autoimmune, Autoimmune hemolytic anemia can yes. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia can cause spherocytosis. Okay, what else? ABO compatibility. ABO compatibility can cause spherocytes. Wilson disease also can cause spherocytes. So Wilson disease, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, ABO compatibility, thermal injury, and clostridial sepsis. Mm -hmm. These are the Sorry, 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 was, the, was the last point, bro? Clostridium sepsis. Clostridium sepsis. Oh. Yes. And thermal okay. injury. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, bro. Clostridium sepsis. So the common ones in, uh, in the neonate, when you see spherocytes, you think either hereditary spherocytosis or ABO compatibility. These are the two conditions which we see in the neonate. Any test we differentiate between them. Simple test. Last time uh, in the medical school, we did it in the physiology. Combs test. No, not combs test. Yeah, so this test differentiates between ABO compatibility and hereditary serocytosis. It is primitive test. Full uh -huh. blood picture. What is it? Osmotic fragility test. Very good, yeah. It's osmotic fragility test. Osmotic fragility test. Very good. Okay, carry on, carry on. Okay, so um, next we go to the management. We have a uh, management. We have screening and prevention. So uh, first, we must do screening for the mothers and fathers that like group, uh, and also a uh, screen for the dyslexia deficiency, uh, hypothyroid uh, screening for TSH and free T4 level, and also immune irritability screening uh, for the prevention and TB immunoglobulin uh, to reduce the negative marker. But uh, I don't know how. And then uh, encourage mother to breastfeed their healthy the baby and eat the newborn about 8 to 12 times per day. And then for the indication for the referral uh, to hospital, uh, 
first it joins this uh, within 24 hours of life. Uh, then join this below the uh, umbilicus, which indicate 200 to 200 uh, macroma per liter. Uh, join this extend to the sole of feet, in which make a reference. And also this baby may need uh, exchange transfusion, as treatment. And then there's the family history of significant hemolytic disease. Uh, the infant is unwell with jaundice and also prolonged jaundice of more than 14 days. Okay, so um, this one is the uh, treatment for the infants that are contributed uh, jaundice. Um, so we have um, phototherapy. Uh, we have uh, exchange transmission for the common shop, we have IV and UAV, and also a uh, phenol monitor. For the uh, contributed, uh, if there is a uh, cost by the military ataxia, we can give the phenol cassai procedure. And uh, the semia, the uh, factors with phenol uh, and then we need to treat under infection. If there is a hypothyroid, we get thyroxine, and also there is a surgical incision of cysts. Okay, so this one is the uh, care practice by monitoring. Uh, so you can look at that. Um, this one is the uh, explanation for the phototherapy. So, uh, indication for the early phototherapy uh, if there's any you know, level rise faster than 0.5 uh, milligram. Uh, persistent or severe metabolic ulcerative acidosis, sepsis, or six very low birth weight infant. So, the mechanism of action in phototherapy, in which the, there is a skin exposure to light uh, that causes the geometric photosynthesis uh, and developing photo isolation, which allow the uh, albumin binding and diffuse. And, but it is not useful in unit with elevated uh, contributed immunity. Okay, and then uh, the technique uh, done in the um, phototherapy, usually we expose the maximum surface area. We must apply the iPad and the gorilla protection to the baby. Shahira, the I yeah. will stop you, Shahira. Go back to the previous slide. Go back to the previous slide. You said not useful in the neonates with elevated, conjugated bilirubin. So there will be one complication. If we use a phototherapy for conjugated bilirubin, there will be one complication. Anyone knows the complication? What complication happened to the baby? It's like burn, burn prof, because hot. No, so I, I, I want some specific. For conjugated bilirubin, something specific. Skin bronze. The skin will uh -huh. be turned bronze. Discoloration. Yes, very good. They call it bronze baby syndrome. Bronze baby syndrome. Very good. Carry on, Shahira. Okay. Um. Okay, and then uh, monitor the hydrogen status, which is the urine output. And then for the uh, effective phototherapy, we use the blue light range. Uh, and then the distance of the light source uh, to the baby is not exceeding 30 to 50 centimeters. Okay, the technique, uh, this one technique done in phototherapy. So the light source, usually we use the light band, spotlight, fiber optic blanket, and TMD. Uh, if I love the light, usually white, blue, or green. And then the wavelength must be 420 to 500 nanometers. Okay. Then the position must be 15 to 20 centimeters of the infant. Uh, must expose the largest surface area. Uh, just in okay, so uh, for the precaution, uh, we must ensure the pattern area of the baby and then uh, maintain the constant volume temperature 
using an incubator and neutral environment. We must assess the temperature every four to eight hours. Maintain the food balance, increase intake and minimize uh, loss of it. We must cover the eyes and engineering of the baby. And we we'll forget to check the skin integrity. Um, we must take frequent diaper changes, water bath, not apply any lotion or oils on the skin. And position of the baby must uh, well positioned to avoid skin irritation. Okay, this is the complication. The baby may have a uh, dehydration. Because there's increased sleep water loss, and uh, maybe we have blue stool, and maybe we have irritability, lethargy, skin nourishes, obesity, retinal injury, uh, adverse effect on cell growth, uh, oxidation sensation with the acid, decreased vitamin and class in the magic baby, and then uh, tending or bone service syndrome. Okay, discuss. Okay. okay, next uh, treatment is the exchange transfusion. Okay, um, the indication for the exchange transmission, um, if there is an uh, intensive intertrophy field and if the patient and the baby have severe hyperbilirubinia, in which they may have risk of clinic stress. And then uh, the type of blood and volume used in the exchange transmission is the fresh whole blood. Uh, and then volume that is is to the influence of the blood volume. Usually the complication that may arise from this kind of treatment is uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, thrombosis. Hepatitis enterocolitis, cardiac arrhythmia, uh, hypotensemia, hypomagnesemia, and glycemia, and as well as respiratory and tuberculosis, and also infection. So this one is the treatment for direct uh, hyperbilirubinia. So we must treat the underlying causes. So uh, if the patient have a uh, cholestasis, we must um, stop the TPN and the cholestasis. We must stop the total blood transfusion. Um, and then we must follow the TPN and cholestasis protocol. Um, however, the penobarbital use is controversial. And if the, patient, if the baby has the ability to adhesia, um, we must uh, do the same procedure with or without liver transplant. Um, and then the uh, hormone antitrypsy, we must do a liver transplant. And then the collagen pulses, uh, surgical removal, and glycosemia, we will uh, not just be uh, no, and separate care if there's no treatment possible. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Shahira. Thank you. Any questions to Shahira? Anyone wants to ask Shahira any question? I have a question. Um, in pediatric protocol, there's a table by NICE guideline and also table by the American Association of Pediatric in indicating the level of um, bilirubin and then when to start the uh, either the phototherapy or the uh, exchange transfusion. My question would be that um, at the leftmost corner of the table, the first uh, column has the hours of life. Um, can uh, you ex uh, explain about how to use the hours of life in relation to the table? Because um, I, I'm, I'm confused with the how to read the table. Thank you. The table is the protocol. Uh, in the pediatric protocol, the table uh, where there is a level of bilirubin correlating with the uh, when to uh, the use of phototherapy and also the um, uh, the exchange transfusion. There's a table. The one, first one is by AAP guideline, and the second one would be the by Dines guideline. My question would be that uh, what is the what is meant by the first column, the hours of life, the six, twelve, twenty-four, forty-eight. Okay, I, I will uh, let me open the pediatric protocol and see. Okay, let me open my computer. Pediatric protocol.
Okay, uh, I will download it from the internet. I couldn't find it in my computer. So, mm, let me download uh, it. Prof, uh, is it 30 I, I can, or 4th edition? I can share the screen mm -hmm. if you want, Prof. Okay, please, please. Yes. This one, Prof. I can't see uh, a clan. Um, can you uh, pin my the the one that I'm presenting, Prof? Yeah, line up, uh, The other student. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, let me bring the phone closer because my phone is small. So your question is the first column, uh, is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, we have the 6, 12 hours of life, 24. I mean, like, what if the value yes. is in between the numbers? Like, let's say we have uh, eight, 8 hours of life or 9 hours of life. Yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah, it, it, it is all uh, just estimation, estimation. It is all estimation. So see the child. In fact, to be accurate, hundred percent, you don't use this table. To be accurate, hundred percent, use the graph. Graph. Yes, for the graph, you will find at every hour of age, you will find certain level. Mm. You will see x axis for the age, and y axis for the bilirubin level. Okay, bro. Do we need to okay. um? Remember the graph, bro? No, no, we don't need. We, at any time, uh, always when we manage the babies, we look for the graph. Everywhere in every hospital you go, you do your housemanship, the world will ha they have the graph. So you just ask for the graph, take the age of the baby, plot on the x-axis, and see, go in the y-axis, see the bilirubin level. Then see where it lies. Is it below the level of phototherapy or above the level of phototherapy? Okay, bro. Okay. Thank you, bro. Welcome. Any other question to uh, Shahira? Uh, uh, my name is Muhammad Dazli. I would like to ask regarding the uh, interrupted breastfeeding. So it's, it's mainly for diagnosis purposes instead of uh, treatment, is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, oh. it is for diagnosis only. Because breast milk jaundice is not dangerous. It's not danger. It does not cause kernectors. Despite it can go high, but does not cause kernectors. Mm -hmm. So we, we do it until uh, until we see finding like We do the interrupted breastfeeding until we, we see if there's any uh, improvement or not. If not, we have to assume other differential. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you, bro. Welcome. Okay, so we go to next presenter. Thanks, Shahira. Okay, I will be the presenter. Okay, Dua. Can you see my slides? Can. Yes. So, um, my topic will be on neonatal anemia. 
So um, the outline of my presentation will be def defining what anemia is, um, going on to the pathology and then history taking, physical examination, and then uh, we'll go on to investigations and treatment. So um, this is the hemoglobin um, a graph of um, how we have um, in our um, red blood cell, we have hemoglobin and globin, right? So there's alpha chains and beta chains. Normally we have alpha chains and two beta chains, but for fetal hemoglobin, it's usually alpha and gamma chains that makes the um, hemoglobin F. After birth, they will start developing the beta chains and there'll be reduction in the gamma, uh, the gamma chains, and then they'll move on to um, the normal adult hemoglobin, which is like A or B, you know. Very nice. This so, graph is very nice. Um, yes, there's, uh, this is the normal hemoglobin values for term and premature infants. So for we'll start with full term first, which is the second column. Um, and for at birth, the normal hemoglobin level will be 19.3. And then as you go on to like 0 0.5 months and one month, you can see that there's a decreasing trend. By nine to 12 weeks, the um, hemoglobin level will be at its lowest. Um, you, it's called um, another point in their life where the mean hemoglobin will be at around 12.2. And then after those nine to 12 weeks, then um, at four to six months, then we will start to see an increasing trend. The same thing in mature, but um, there will be, uh, the values will be less than full term. So at birth, um, their um, hemoglobin values will be less and then uh, their decreasing trend will be lower basically. So instead of 11.2, it will be 94 at the nadir point and then to six months, then it will start to increase back up again. Uh, this is important when we will come to explain about physiological anemia. So the definition of anemia is defined as hema uh, hematocrit or hemoglobin concentration uh, going to um, uh, more than two standard deviations below the mean of age. Or we can um, define it as central venous hemoglobin of less than 13, capillary hemoglobin of less than 14.5, or hem hematocrit uh, less than 45% in um, patients. So Yes. Dua, I want to ask you a question. Yeah, I don't know that before. Uh, why central venous hemoglobin is different from capillary hemoglobin? Uh, because of the, um, from what I, how I understand it, is that the capillary um, hemoglobin uh, will more deposition of red blood cells. More like deposition of the blood cells. Yeah, we can get more um, red blood cells from the capillary from capillaries rather than the central venous. Okay. So the yes. will be higher. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. So the pathophysiology, um, we will be talking about four, um, which is physiological uh, anemia, hemorrhagic anemia, hemolytic anemia, and hypoplastic. So starting with physiological. Um, this is normal. It is the most common cause of anemia in young infants. Um, it usually occurs about six to nine weeks of age, um, which is what we showed in the graph uh, in the table earlier. And this is usually caused because there is um, a decrease in erythropoiesis after birth. Uh, this is a result of the decrease in erythropoiesis is because there will be increased tissue uh, oxygenation, and therefore there will be a reduced production of erythropoietin because of a negative cycle that oh, the tissue super perfuse, so there'll be rest production of erythropoietin. In healthy infants, um, hemoglobin levels are high at birth, usually more than 14, and then there'll be a rapid decline, um, re approximately at 11, um, at six to nine weeks of life. This is usually called physiological nadir. Um, how to differentiate this physiological from pathological anemia um, is that the anemia, um, the hemoglobin uh, in pathological anemia, hemoglobin of 13.5 within the month of life, which basically means that before the nadir point, there will be um, a, a reduction of less than 13. 
0.5 like the reading. And then, or the anemia will have a lower hemoglobin level that is seen um, at that age. Uh, with physiological anemia, example, it will be less than nine, or there will be signs of hemolysis, such as jaundice, um, scrip, uh, uh, all the other signs of jaundice. Um, or there can be symptoms of anemia, such as irritability or poor feeding. Usually for um, physiological jaundice, it does not require uh, extensive, uh, sorry, physiological anemia, it does not require extensive evaluation or treatment. So, uh, everybody clear on this? Before we move on, okay, I'm gonna take that. What's Nadi? It's it's called um, it's a physical decrease in hemoglobin. It uh, you can call it physiological anemia or Nadir. Oh, physiological anemia or Nadir. Oh, okay. So for hemorrhagic anemia. Um, it's because of blood loss. So in neonates, the absolute blood volume is low. Um, in preterm babies, um, it's usually 90 to 105 milligrams per kg. And in term babies, it's usually 78 to 86 milligrams per kg. So in this case, um, any acute blood loss, as little as 15 milliliters of um, may result in anemia. So an infant with a Loss, actually, blood loss can compensate physiologically better and be more stable than an infant with acute blood loss. And that the acute blood loss here is as little as 15 to 20 milliliters of blood. So um, this can be caused by um, three um, main points that we will be going on to explain. So, loss in blood loss and postpartum blood loss. But it's important to remember that diagnostic such as am amniocentesis or conic villus sampling, umbilical cord blood sampling can also lead to this blood loss. So we will start by um, So the causes for this uh, blood loss will be like fetal hemorrhage. This usually occurs spontaneously um, or can result as a, a cause of uh, from a maternal trauma, amniocentesis, um, external virgin tumors arising in the uh, placenta. Um, it usually affects 50% of pregnancies, but the volume of blood loss is usually very low. So it's not um, enough to cause um, hemorrhagic anemia because usually the blood loss is of milliliters. However, if we have a massive loss of more than 30 milliliters, it, um, that can cause fetal to maternal hemorrhage and then cause um, um, hemorrhagic anemia. And you, that usually occurs in about three to 1,000 pregnancies. There's open to twin transfusion um, as a cause of antipartum hemorrhage. Um, it is uh, usually due to unequal sharing of blood supply between twin. Uh, so about 30, 30 monozygotic monocryonic twins. Um, so you'll have a donor and a recipient in this case. Sorry, recipient, it's spelled weird. Um, twin, in twin to twin transfusion, if there is a significant transfer of blood from one twin to the other, the donor twin will become anemic and may suffer from features of heart failure. And the recipient twin will be cytemic and then the high. Ha, they'll have hyperviscosity due to the transfer. There are also causes of malformations and placental abnormalities. So for cord malformations, we will focus on two, the vasa previa and the velamentous insertion. So in vasa previa, um, it's the first picture whereby the um, fetal blood vessels within the, uh, are, within the membranes are located low or internal os. So if there becomes pressure from the fetal head, there can actually be bleeding of the internal os. Okay, and for the velamentous um, insertion, as you can see that there's not, uh, in the second picture, there's um, three, the, nor the first one is normal, where you can see that the umbilical cord is coming out of the placenta and into the baby. And then um, in the second picture, you can see that the cord is actually coming out a little bit away from the placenta. So they're in that space, they'll be exposed blood vessels. And it becomes worse when it's with vasa previa as well. 
whereby you can see that the exposed blood vessels run um, from the placenta to under the baby's head and then go on to the baby. And over there, when there's pressure from the baby's head, then the bleeding can be um, bigger. Uh, moving on to placental abnormalities. Uh, so in placental abnormalities, the ones that we want to focus on is placenta previa and abruptio placentae. So in abruptio placentae, obviously there will be like a lot of bleeding. In placenta previa, uh, we there is um, there can be little such as if there's low implantation, then there can be little bleeding. Uh, partial previa the bleeding will be um, a little bit more and in total placenta previa will have uh, massive bleeding in some cases. Um, so this is for uh, antepartum. Any more questions? Uh, any questions on antepartum before we go to intrapartum? Uh, I have one question. For yeah. the antepartum, uh, for the twin, uh, twin, twin transmission now, yeah. The the recipient will have polycythemia and also hyperviscosity, right? Will that also lead to stroke after a while? Um, I did not read about strokes, but I think the idea of it is to manage the recipient before hyperviscosity can lead to a stroke. Oh, okay, thank you. You are you have when you have polycythemia, it is always the risk factor. It is one of the virtuous triads. Yeah. Polycythemia always risk factor for stroke. It is one of the causes of stroke in the infants. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Okay, welcome. Do I can you hear me? And yet. Uh in what condition does the sister to maintain hemorrhage of okay. Me? In what condition does the fetal to maternal hemorrhage occur? Oh, it usually occurs spontaneously, or if there is maternal trauma, or uh, let's say the baby is not lying properly, external version, or if there is a tumor. But the spontaneous occurrence, um, it usually affects 50% of pregnancies, so it's actually pretty common. But in those 50%, the amount is very minimal, um, so it doesn't cause hemorrhagic anemia in, in the when there is massive uh, loss, which is more than 13 millimeters, it occurs in about 1,000 pregnancies because of those maternal trauma and use in cases and such. So the hemorrhage of the origin for the mother, and then later it affects the physical circulation. Uh, I'm sorry, can you raise your voice? Uh, um, the hemorrhage is starts from the mother and then later it affects the fetal circulation, is it? Um, the hemorrhage will occur between the mother and the fetal circulation. It's not like the mom is bleeding and then the fetus will have anemia. Mm. Okay. It is in the void, junction between, above the placenta. So the void of where the maternal blood comes and the fetal blood is there. That's why they call it fetal material. material. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to intrapartum. So, uh, um, partum, uh, hemorrhage will usually happen in a precipitous delivery, that is a rapid and spontaneous delivery, which causes due to umbilical cord tearing. So think of this as almost an aggressive delivery. Um, or it can happen because of obstetric accidents, such as um, incision of placenta during cesarean delivery or any uh, other birth trauma that can happen, um, let's say, during instrumentation. There can also be coagulopathy, um, both in the mother and the child side, that can cause in hemorrhage. Um, and we, at this point, we have to um, focus on sub subgedial sub bleeds, which can wrap and into the soft tissue. And they will uh, like gather there or sequester there um, enough sufficient um, uh, blood volume to cause anemia, hypertension, and shock and death. Um, so obstetric trauma, because these are, new, uh, these are newborn, have to think of the subgedial bleeds, because the subgedial bleeds, sorry, because 
because sutures are not um, fused yet. So there can actually be a large volume that is hiding under there. Um, so in uh, trauma, uh, it can cause occult uh, visceral or intracranial hemorrhage. So neonates with intracranial hemorrhage can lose sufficient blood into their intracranial intra vaults and cause anemia and sometimes um, hemodynamic compromise such as hypertension shock eventually leading to death. Because unlike older children who have a lower head to body ratio and their intracranial hemorrhage is limited because uh, in volume because the they have fused cranial sutures and these fused sutures will not allow them to uh, expand. So instead, there'll be a buildup of intracranial pressure and that may be able to stop the bleeding if it's so massive. And then they'll show signs of increased intracranial pressure. While in neonates, because sutures are not um, fused, there'll be less signs of intra increased intracranial pressure because there can be expansion into the that intracranial space. Go on. Can I ask? Yes. Uh, I don't really understand why the mother with the obliquities can cause neonate anemia. Um, because this is intrapartum. So this is at a point where the mother is giving birth. So um, if there comes uh, a rapid and it's basically aggressive delivery, then there can be umbilical cord care. So if the mother starts bleeding um, and there's umbilical cord carrying, then the child can bleed as well. So it's due to the um, stress to the umbilical cord and yes. the mother? Okay. So um, in postpartum, um, hemorrhage, it's usually an enclosed hemorrhage. If there is an enclosed, sorry, it's not usually. If there is an enclosed hemorrhage, may stress of trauma or severe perinatal stress, such as caput secundum or cephalohematoma uh, or intravenous hemorrhage and vis uh, visceral hemorrhage. There it can also be caused by defects in hemostasis, um, congenital coagulation uh, factor deficiency, uh, consumption coagulopathy, such as a disseminated intervascular coagulation or uh, sepsis, or there can be a vitamin K deficiency, in which case, um, failure to give vitamin K um, that's bleeding at three to four days of age. Um, there can be thrombocytopenia, such as immune or congenital, and um, it uh, blood loss due to blood draws. Remember that the neonates or the babies have smaller blood volumes. So if we draw a lot of blood from them, then we can actually induce anemia. Okay, uh, Dua, I will interrupt you. I will ask one question, open question. So you mentioned uh, the vitamin K deficiency, which is hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, and you mentioned DIC. How to differentiate by investigations? What is the difference in the blood investigations between DIC and vitamin K deficiency? Open question. Uh, uh, prof, I think uh, if a vitamin K deficiency is only affect the coagulation profile, however, with uh, the IC, it will affect both uh, coagulation profile as well as the platelet. Very good. Correct answer. Yes. This is the answer. This is the answer. Yes. So the IC will have thrombocytopenia, raised PT, and raised APTT. Why vitamin K deficiency only raised? PT and ABTT with normal blood. Thanks. Okay, carry on. Dua. So this is just a picture of the hemorrhage. So we're going to move on to hemolytic anemia. So this is the usual blood groups. Um, we have A, B, A, B, and O. Um, so um, this is just a blue vision. Um, in group A, uh, the antibodies in plasma will be anti-B. In group B, uh, antibodies will be anti-A. AB will have no antibodies. Group O will have antibodies for both because of the, the antigens that they have in their blood. 
So um, in hemolytic anemia, there can be um, three uh, causes, immune hemolysis, immune hemolysis, and endocrine defects. In immune hemolysis, there can be ABO or recessive incompatibilities. It can be autoimmune or fetal maternal hemorrhage. Um, in non-immune, there can be stored infections or reduced hemolysis. Erythrocyte defects such as uh, G6PD, uh, thalassemia, hereditary um, spherocytosis, and sickle cell. Which may clear. So we will move on to hypoplastic. Causes. Uh, hypoplastic causes can be congenital or acquired. Um, in congenital, we can have Fanconi anemia and diamond black fins. These both affect um, bone marrow, whereby there will be um, less production of um, um, red blood cells within the bone marrow. Um, in one of them, I think it's diamond uh, black fin syndrome, there will be um, less. Uh, reticulocytes within the peripheral blood film as well. Uh, for congenital, we can also um, consider congenital leukemia or sideroblastic anemia. In acquired, um, we have to consider infections with parovirus uh, or rubella, nutritional defici uh, deficiencies such as iron, copper, folate, vitamin B12, B6, C, and E. Uh, we also have to uh, consider uh, aplastic anemia and it can also be caused by anemia of prematurity. Okay, uh, Dua, I will yes. stop you. I will ask one question. Uh, okay, I will ask you. Can you tell <laughs> us uh, what are the skeletal features of Fanconi anemia and diamond Blackfan syndrome? What are the skeletal features? Oh, skeletal I, abnormalities. I, I, I'm not sure about that, I'm sorry. Okay, so open question. Anyone knows skeletal abnormalities in diamond black fan syndrome or Fanconi anemia? Open question. Fanconi, we have short stature. Okay. Short stature, yes. What about limb abnormalities? Any limb abnormalities in Fanconi anemia? Loss of a uh, thumb. So okay, so they may have absent thumb. Very good. They may have absent thumb or absent radius. Absent thumb or absent radius. What about diamond black fan? I should <laughs> they can have the, the same thing also thumbs. they may have thumb. Yes, yes. Three phalangeal thumbs. Yes, please. Try phalangeal thumb. So the amount of black fan also may have thumb abnormalities. Try phalangeal thumb or also they may have absent thumb. So again, the amount of black fan common to have thumb abnormalities, Fanconi, thumb abnormalities, and absent radius. There is one common question if you are interested in pediatrics and uh, you are going to sit for uh, Roy College exams. What are the causes of absent radius? They are famous for causes of absent radius. One of them is Fanconi anemia. Three other conditions. So I give you a clue. Uh, one of the conditions uh, is uh, autosomal dominant condition associated with ASD. Associated with A. William syndrome? Uh -huh. William syndrome? No, not William syndrome. Mm. Which syndrome is associated with ASD? Mm. Start with H, H O. Holt-Oram syndrome. Holt Very good. Holt-Oram. Holt-Oram syndrome. So Holt-Oram syndrome, they may have absent radius. So cause of absent radius include Fanconi anemia, Holt-Oram syndrome, and two more conditions, pneumonics. 
the two other conditions are mnemonics. One from seven alphabets and one from three alphabets. One starts with V, the other starts with T. Yes? Thrombocytopenia absent radius. Very good. Thrombocytopenia absent radius. Star. They call it TAR. TAR syndrome. TAR syndrome. Thrombocytopenia absent radius. TAR syndrome. That's one. Very good. The other one start with V. V A. They may have tracheoesophageal fistula. V A C T E R N. Mm -hmm. They may have tracheoesophageal fistula. Vector. Vectoral. Very good. Vectoral. So these are the common causes of absent radius. Fanconi anemia, Star syndrome, Holt Oram syndrome, and Bacteral syndrome. Okay, very good. Carry on. Okay. So we will move on to diagnostic approach. So presentation, we have to always determine the following factors, which is the age at presentation. Um, any associated clinical features, um, you know, that hemodynamic status of the infant, as well as if there is presence or absence of a compensatory reticulocytosis. Um, and signs of uh, pill anemia are similar, uh, perinatal anemia are similar, regardless of the cause, but they can vary with severity and rate of onset of the anemia. The major uh, physiological impact of anemia increase in oxygen delivery to the tissues, and that will result in both compensatory spo uh, responses and acute or chronic consequences that can include poor growth, decreased activity, and limited cardiovascular reserve. So we'll go on to um, each um, type of anemia, just hemolytic and hemolytic. Uh, comparison of the first two, both of them will present with pallor. Um, hemorrhagic um, presents at birth, uh, can be a sudden onset and it can be uh, an easy. There is no jaundice in hemolytic, but there can be hemolytic uh, in hemolytic, there will be jaundice because of the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. In hemorrhagic, there can be cyanosis that is unrelieved by uh, supplemental oxygen. Um, there can be uh, there will be poor perfusion or um, signs of hypovolemic. Um, there can be decreased central venous pressure, uh, normal cytic, normal chromic, um, RBC in this, and you will have to look for any other uh, any sources of bleeding such as the bowel in hemolytic um, remember that there will be jaundice they, they can also present with hepatosplenomegaly um, failure to thrive because their blood is being hemolytic sorry confusion is repeated twice they can also pre, uh, with seizures or kernicteric encephalopathy because of the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and there can be reticulocytosis. Um, they will still in hypoplastic uh, presentation. Others still there. Um, it's usually uncommon. There will be anemic symptoms. However, there will be no jaundice and no reticulocytosis. It can be an enlarged. Um, or can present with heart or renal failure. Um, there is non-specific chorizal symptoms or generalized um, rash illness or arthropathy um, relating to a virus. Um, the onset can be three within three to two weeks, and it's not resolving by three to six months. Um, there will be an increased requirement of supplemental oxygen, unlike um, hemorrhagic, which is sorry unlike hemorrhagic, unrelieved by supplemental oxygen, and they can be poor weight gain as well. So others, such as twin to twin transfusion, they can present with growth failure in the anemic twin, um, often more than 20%.
and in occult or internal hemorrhage, if there is intracranial hemorrhage, um, you would note that there will be a bulging anterior fontanelle and neurological signs such as altered status, apnea, or seizures. Um, in vessel hemorrhage, they can uh, almost often the liver is damaged and that would lead to an abdominal mass. Um, in pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, the radiographic uh, pacification of the hemothorax with a uh, bloody tracheal may be obvious. So um, we move on to history. History, we want to focus on birth history, uh, such as um, the three major parts that we covered, which is antenatal, intrapartum, and postpartum. In all, you have to know if it's a single pregnancy, was there any ant antipartum hemorrhage, and the mother's and this. Um, in intrapartum, um, you want to know if it was a spontaneous vertex delivery or C-section. Um, what is the gestational week of the baby? Was there any bleeding? Was there any placenta previa or placenta abruption? Or was there any instrumental delivery that can lead to birth trauma? Postpartum, you want to know if there was any bleeding tendencies, um, birth trauma, um, any head swell, any exchange transfusion. That, um, you also want to focus on their feeding history, such as type and the amount. You want to focus on their growth development to know, note if there's any failure to thrive. And you want to uh, read into their family history, such as any thalassemia, um, any anemia in the family, uh, the ethnicity of the family, and any hereditary blood disorder. Such as or sickle cell. So for examinations and investigations, um, for a physical exam, you can refer to um, the previous notes where we discussed the three different types of um, anemia. But generally, you want to know if the baby is active or not, if they're le lethargic looking, or if there's any. Um, you want to know if they're pale, if they're jaundiced or cyanosis. Um, is there any dysmorphism or bleeding tendencies? You want to know the hemodynamic status and the vital signs. Um, you want to know if there's any signs of respiratory distress, any any skin rash or bruise there. So we move on to inversions. Um, in investigations, you want to take a full blood count, including reticulocytes, a full blood film, um, typing and direct Coombs test, uh, bilirubin, total and indirect. And you want to take uh, the higher Betke test. I'm not sure if I'm uh, pronouncing it right, but this test is basically looking for uh, fetal red blood cells, mom's blood. Um, so uh, maternal blood, and you look, you're looking for, um, if you find both blood cells, then you, it can be uh, signs of fetal maternal hemorrhage. You want to, to, to take coagulation study, um, hemoglobin electrophoresis, uh, ultrasonogram for internal bleeding, such as of the head or the abdomen, and you want to take bone marrow aspiration if it's needed. Um, so for the treatment of neonatal anemia, um, we'll divide it into three, prenatal, intranatal, and postnatal. Prenatal will be uh, uh, injections, uh, injections in rhesus negative mothers. Uh, fetal treatment is required. In intranatal, you lay the cord clamping so that the baby, like, the contractions of the cord can give the baby more blood, like, you know, push more blood into the baby. In postnatal, you want to um, consider simple transfusions for symptomatic newborns, such as premature babies on oxy. You can also exchange transfusion for severe hemolytic anemia. Um, to treat the underlying cause by like iron supplements or steroids. You want to take, uh, you want to um, obviously give nutritional Supplements such as iron folate and vitamin E, and always give supportive therapy, which um, includes uh, oxygen therapy. You limit venous sections and erythropoietin given in prematurity because of pre uh, anemia of prematurity. References, and we're open for questions. Okay, any question to Dua? Uh, sorry, I would like to ask, I think maybe, I'm not sure whether I've mentioned previously or not, but uh, what's like, 
definition of uh, early or late uh, delay clamp uh, clamping like the the timing is it like one minute or um i can answer that <laughs> okay so for um cord clamping if uh, it, it should not go up to one minute because um if i'm not mistaken what i remember my ong posting is that mm -hmm. you're supposed to observe the cord for contractions oh so it's supposed if it's so what's the definition for early and and late uh, and delayed uh, cord clamping? I can't give you a time. Oh, <laughs> so maybe if someone knows, they can help. I see. Okay, but 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 you mentioned previously that um, at least we have to wait at least one one minute before we can uh, decide to clamp lah, based on uh, the one you said regarding the ONG. No, not up to one minute. Because if you wait too long, then it's actually counterproductive. If you wait too mm -hmm. long, then there will be blood flowing out of the um, fetus into the mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Prof. Okay. Uh, I have a um, for the uh, uh, the, uh, black fan diamond syndrome just now, diamond black fan syndrome, um, the hypoplastic anemia, meaning that the patient must be on transfusion indefinitely or, I mean, is it like um, major thalassemia? Or diamond black fan? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about the treatment of diamond black fan. All right. Uh, Dua. Yes. Sorry for interruption. Just now I went to my daughter. Just now there was one question uh, about uh, delayed cord clamping, is it? Yes. Um, does we ask what is the definition of delayed cord clamping? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was the answer? I didn't give an answer. <laughs> you didn't give the answer. Huh? Also, I don't know uh, what is the exact time. Yeah. Uh, so we can go and find, find out. Anyone from the students knows the exact time? Because I, I, I did I did search uh, previously, but um, they they don't I, I did not manage to find like a definite uh, answer. It's like something uh, yeah. like that. You can ask Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khaliq. Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khaliq has very good uh, neonatal experience. Oh. Maybe you can get answer from him. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof, um, I can also ask about treatment of diamond black fat, um, whether yeah. it will all it will always be on transfusion. Diamond black fat syndrome, uh, they require transfusion. Uh, a few percentage of them, they are lucky. They have spontaneous resolution, and uh, some of them respond to steroids. So you can try steroids. You count the parenthesis and try steroid use and then uh, bone marrow transplant also is effective if you have much sibling donor bone marrow transplant also is effective in them thank you bro welcome okay thank you thank you okay any other question to do If no other question, we we'll go to the next presenter. Okay, assalamualaikum. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see the slide? Okay. 
Yes, I can see the slide. Can you turn off the sharing button? How? <laughs> Just hi. 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 Oh, hi. Okay. Hi. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Alia Shahira bin Dijaruddin. So today I will present to you about neonatal thrombocytopenia. So first, by definition, thrombocytopenia means when the platelet count is less than 150 times to, times to the power of 9 per liter. So it can be classified in units, it can be classified into mild, moderate and severe. So for mild, uh, it is 100 to 150 for moderate, 50 to 100 and severe is when the platelet count is less than 50. 50,000. So basically, a uh, platelet is uh, a non-nuclear cell, so it involved in the primary hemostasis. Uh, one minute, Shahira. Yes. Shahira. Yes. Because I, I cannot see the slides here, I'm seeing in my laptop. What I see is uh, mild 50 to 150, and moderate 20 to 50, and severe less than 20. Uh, that's, that one, I think I have a mistake. Mm -hmm. Which one you see? I see the definition first, first slide. So you yes. said mild thrombocytopenia, bleated 50 to 150, moderate thrombocytopenia, bleated 20 to 50, severe thrombocytopenia, bleated less than 20. Uh, okay, uh, for that, actually, for the severity, I just correct, correct it just now because the original one. Uh, I think it's for uh, children in general, not in, not for new needs. I see. What mm -hmm. references did you use? Uh, for this one. Uh, for yeah, the for one, one that, the that one. you get, for the one in the previous slide is from the textbook. And for the, uh, the, the new one, I no, the sun, the illustrated textbook. Okay. And the new one is from article uh, Medscape. Okay, okay. Okay. So, so can you repeat the new one again? So the new one, mine, is between uh, 150 to 100, moderate, mm -hmm. 100 to 50, and severe, mm -hmm. less than 50. Is it correct? Okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I have okay. to go and see. Okay. okay. Nice. But Medscape is good reference. If you take it from Medscape, Medscape yes. is reliable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Doctor. So, uh, so platelet is a non-nuclear cell. So involved, uh, as you all know, it involves in the primary hemostasis. So platelet uh, developed from megakaryocyte progenitor cells. So uh, the production is stimulated by thrombopoietin. So um. The mature megakaryocyte will then generate and release the platelet cell into the bloodstream. So the usual half-life for platelet is uh, 7 to 10 days. So uh, platelet, the action of platelet, uh, it attach, it acts by attached to any adhesion molecule which exposed if there is any break in the endothelial wall and then it will aggregate and form the primary hemostasis. After the primary hemostasis, then it will followed by the activation of the coagulation cascade and fibrin deposition to form a mature clot, which is uh, which called as secondary hemostasis. So a bit epi epidemiology about neonatal thrombocytopenia. It is uh, not really common in a well newborn babies. So the percentage is only less uh, less than one percent. However, for NICU patient, it's quite high, which is around eighteen to thirty five percent, and also uh, very high in uh, infant with extreme low birth weight, which uh, around seventy three percent. So among the NICU patient. Uh, most of them, 75% of them, having mild type of thrombocytopenia. Only 25% are having severe type of thrombocytopenia. Meanwhile, in the extreme low birth weight uh, infants, most of them having severe type of thrombocytopenia. 
So the etiology uh, can be classified into fetal, early onset and late onset. So fetal basically uh, when it happened uh, during the pregnancy itself can be caused by autoimmune congenital infection or autoimmune causes like ITP uh, of the mother. And then for early onset, uh, early onset means it occur within 72 hours of life. So the causes can be caused by placental insufficiency like Preeclampsia, IUGR, or maternal diabetes, or prenatal asphyxia, prenatal infection, uh, and TOSH, and need the IC, autoimmune or autoimmune causes. For the late onset, it happened after 72 hours of life of the baby. So the common causes is sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis. Other causes can be congenital infection or autoimmune. So this is uh, dif differences between early onset and late onset of uh, neonatal thrombocytopenia. So for the early onset, the degree of thrombocytopenia is between mild to moderate. The, most of them is between mild to moderate. And for the, uh, it evolves slowly over several days and usually associated with complicated pregnancy like preeclampsia, IUGR, maternal diabetes. And uh, the mechanism involved in the early onset thrombocytopenia usually due to impact that lead production. And it rarely requires any specific treatment. For the late onset, the degree of thrombocytopenia is usually severe, which is less than 50, and it has uh, rapid onset and rapid progression with, uh, within 24 to 28 hours, and commonly associated with sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis. So the mechanism involved in the late onset is a combination between platelet cons consumption and also impact production of platelet. So in uh, the late onset, usually uh, the baby need multiple platelet transfusion. So for the history, among of the uh, important history that we need to take first, maternal past medical history. If the mother had any history of autoimmune disease like immune thrombocytopenia or uh, SLE, and also did, did the mother take any medication like chlorothiazide, tobutamide, or quinine, uh, because all of these uh, drugs can have cytotoxic effect on the fetal marrow, which then impact the production of the platelet. And then any uh, the past obstetric history, we ask uh, the mother any history of previously affected baby, like uh, the same event, any history of stillbirth, pregnancy induced hypertension, eclampsia, IUGR, congenital or prenatal infection. And birth history, uh, we ask uh, any history of prenatal asphyxia or preterm delivery because this uh, this type, this group of baby have high risk to develop neonatal thrombocytopenia. So for the clinical features, uh, so yeah, so firstly we look at the general condition of the baby. So the baby might appear sick. So if the baby appear to be sick, like it looking irritable, so it uh, can be uh, usually caused by any inflammatory causes like sepsis or NEC. And if the baby had jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, or any retinal findings, it can suggest uh, the baby to have any congenital intrauterine infection. And then the important thing that we need to see if uh, is the presence of any pupura, PTK, or ecchymosis. So uh, PTK is so the PTK is about 1 to 3 millimeter, pupura more than 3 millimeter, and ecchymosis is 1 to 2, more than 1 centimeter, basically. So, and then in severe cases, uh, if uh, the baby had spontaneous bleeding, uh, the baby might also present with epistasis or mucosal bleeding. And also we need to look for any intracranial bleeding uh, sign symptom like uh, vomiting, seizure, lethargy, confusion, or extreme irritability in the infant. And also, if the baby develop anemia complicated from the bleeding, uh, the baby might appear as pale. 
Next, for investigation, we divide into blood, imaging and others. So for blood, we can do full blood count first to, do, to see at the platelet level. And then also, we can see the white cell count to rule out any infection causes or inflammatory causes. And then also hemoglobin uh, to see if there is anemia, complication from the bleeding. And after full blood count, we can do preferred blood smear. So what we want to see in the preferred blood smear is uh, to see the platelets uh, morphology. So if uh, the platelet size is large, it's more suggestive to, for preferred destruction of the platelet. While if the platelet size is small, it's more suggestive for platelet production problem. <coughs> Next, we, we also can do coagulation profile to rule out any coagulation. Can you repeat again about the platelet size? Uh, if large, it's suggestive for prefer preferred destruction. And if the platelet mm -hmm. size is small, is it is more suggestive for platelet production problem. Mm -hmm. the, okay, I will ask open a question. Can someone tell me uh, two syndromes? One syndrome has a small platelet and a thrombocytopenia, and another syndrome has large platelet and thrombocytopenia. Okay, open question. So, so I give you a blue. Yes, yes. For mm -hmm. large for large plate, is it ATP? For large plate, it is ATP. In the double side, to one. Uh, no, it is syndrome. It is one syndrome. Awesome. CAMT syndrome, Prof. Congenital amegacaryocytic uh, thrombocytopenia, CAMT. Yes, congenital amegacaryocytic thrombocytopenia. No, it is not that one. Uh, Prof, is it with Scott Aldrich syndrome? Westcott Aldrich. Westcott Aldrich causes a small platelet. Micro thrombocytopenia. What else do they have, Westcott Aldrich? They have eczema. Immune deficiency. They have eczema. And immune primary immunodeficiency. Immunodeficiency. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So they have small platelet. Thrombocytopenia, that's why we call it microthrombocytopenia. So the blades are small and little. Microthrombocytopenia, again, they have eczema and they have immunodeficiency. So this is Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. So which one has large platelet and small number? Start with B. Bernard Solier. Yes, Bernard Solier syndrome. Very good. Bernard. Solier syndrome. Okay, carry on. Okay, uh, and then we can also do blood culture and sensitivity if we suspect patient uh, to have sepsis. And the dimer rarely, rarely done, but it can be done in uh, patient with uh, DIC. And then anti antibody screening if, if we suspect the uh, infant to have uh, the, the thrombocytopenia causes by immune. And then touch screening because a uh, touch infection can cause uh, thrombocytopenia. And then imaging the we can first we can do the uh, the non non radiative non radiative uh, uh, method which is by head ultrasound to see if there is any bleeding. Usually we uh, do the head ultrasound if we suspect the uh, baby to have uh, any intracranial bleeding usually in the severe type of thrombocytopenia. Other than that, we can also do karyotyping because some syndrome is said to be associated with uh, neonatal thrombocytopenia. And also bone marrow examination. Uh, if we uh, suspect the causes is due to the bone marrow failure, so we want to quantify the megakaryocyte. So if the megakaryocyte amount is few, it indicate the uh, platelet production low. If uh, the megakaryocyte is high, it means the, the problem is the peripheral. So it means that it, uh, the causes is due to platelet destruction. 
So next for management, uh, so the choice of, of treatment is uh, between oral penicillin, IVIG, platelet transfusion. So actually for uh, management, it we can prevent neonatal thrombocytopenia even before the baby delivered. So we can give to the mother, yeah, usually we give to the mother with any history of ITP or SLE to prevent. Uh, so we can give oral penicillin or IVIG and then Post delivery, uh, the choices uh, of treatment uh, is either IVIG or platelet transfusion. However, most of the case does not need any treatment, so we just uh, treat conservatively, depending on the severity of the uh, thrombocytopenia. So uh, this is uh, a summary on how uh, we want. I mean, the indication for transfuse uh, with platelet. So it is divided into non-bleeding neonate, bleeding neonate, and uh, NAITP is neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenic. thrombocytopenic. So uh, for the non-bleeding, usually we do not transfuse unless the, le uh, the level is less than 30, which is very low, or if if it is more than 30, we transfuse if the patient have uh, clinically unstable or have previous major bleeding concurrent with coagulopathy or maybe the infant need uh, surgery or exchange transfusion. So in this, of, in this case, we need to transfuse patient. But uh, if more than 50 and above, we uh, the, doesn't need to transfuse with platelet. However, for bleeding unit, most uh, of the case we need to transfuse unless the platelet count is more than 99. And same with NITP, neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenic. So we need to transfuse uh, unless if the level is more than 99. So uh, how if for NA, NAITP, special things that we need to take note is we need to transfuse with a HPA compatible platelet. So, so next, uh, complication in general uh, in neonatal thrombocytopenia, it can cause bleeding or hemorrhage. It, it can uh, occur anywhere in the body, in the brain, GIT, lung, or renal. And if not treated properly and immediately, it can cause mortality to the newborn. Mm, that's all. Any question to Shaira about thrombocytopenia? Any question? Okay, if no questions, we go to the next presentation. Thanks, Shaira. Thank you, Dr. Assalamualaikum. Can you hear me? Assalamualaikum, Amirun. Okay, so I will present uh, for next topic is hemorrhagenesis of newborn. Can you see the slide? Yes. Next. Okay, so... Can you hide the sharing? Okay, good. Okay. Right. So hemorrhage disease of newborn. This is small outline. Okay. First introduction, epidemiology, classification, etiology, clinical features, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, management, complication, and also prognosis. So what is mean by hemorrhage disease of newborn? So now it's known as vitamin K deficiency bleeding, not uh, use any more hemorrhage disease of newborn. So vitamin K deficiency bleeding is an acquired coagulopathy. Secondary to reduction of vitamin K dependent coagulation factors below the hemostatic level. So it's basically uh, deficient in the vitamin K. So before we proceed, we must know what is type of vitamin K. We have three type of vitamin K. First is K1, known as philoquinone. It's come from our uh, vegetable products, vegetable oil and also dairy products. While K2 is menaquinone. It's synthesized by our gut flora and also uh, K3, menadione, which is synthetic. 
So uh, this is mnemonics uh, that you must remember for this presentation. Very important in our coagulation cascade. It's important in factor two, which is prothrombin, seven, nine, and also 10. So this is uh, easy mnemonic. Lah. And this mnemonic is also for uh, useful for warfarin, which is also known as anti-vitamin A. Okay, so this is... Okay, so this is uh, the pathogenesis and clinical finding of vitamin K deficiency. This uh, diagram uh, basically summarizes uh, of the pathogenesis. So basically when a uh, newborn, they have deficiency of vitamin K because first of all, they have reduced uh, uh, receive of vitamin Amirul, K. I, I can't see the, the diagram. You said there is diagram. I can't see diagram. Okay, so first of all, uh because uh because in a newborn there was why there was small bowel bacteria overgrowth first of all because during first uh week of life there will be uh sterile gut means mean there will be no bacteria so because of the no bacteria so there will be no vitamin k uh production at that time so because of that they will they will be decreased lot of vitamin k deficiency and another reason because when a mother use antibiotic during the pregnancy, so they will also cause this uh, this small bowel bacteria overgrowth. So because of this, they will be destroyed of normal flora and also reduce gut flora synthesis. Therefore, there will be vitamin K deficiency, which is vitamin K2. For as other example is uh, exposure to vitamin K antagonists, like I said before, which is warfarin. So with these warfarins, so they will be uh, that uh, used by the mother. They will be inhibit the vitamin K. So they will be reduce vitamin K, cause the vitamin K deficiency. That will later on for the newborn will cause vitamin K deficiency bleeding. Another example is dietary deficiency and so malabsorption. Uh, malabsorption because of these uh, three features, which is gastrointestinal mucosal disease pancreatic insufficient and also cholecystasis. Later on, I will explain uh, detail about the classification of the vitamin K deficiency bleeding. So from this vitamin K deficiency bleeding, so they will uh, decrease in the clot factors that I said before, 297, uh, 279 and 10. So because of these uh, defects, they will be decreased in clotting pathway and also extra clotting pathway. For extrinsic, it will be factor, uh, factor 2 and also factor 7, while factor 10, while intrinsic will be factor 7 and also factor 9. So because of this uh, deficit, deficit, so will be bleeding tendency occur during the newborn. So the presentation will be, if in, involved in GI, it will be gastrointestinal tract. Can you say again which one is intrinsic and which one is extrinsic? Intrinsic will be factor 10 and also factor 7, and factor 9 and also factor 7. And extrinsic no, factor, will be factor 7 is extrinsic. Factor oh, 7 factor is intrinsic, seven. yes. Extrinsic. Factor, factor nine, 9 is intrinsic. 2 factor and 10, they are in the common pathway. Ah, yes. Common pathway. Okay, factor 2 and 10, common pathway. Factor 7 extrinsic, factor 9 intrinsic. Yes, exactly. Okay. So later I will talk about the clinical presentation. So for next, uh, epidemiologically, so this I uh, why currently is uncommon to have uh, vitamin K deficiency bleeding because now we have vitamin K prophylaxis during first week of life or adverse that be given. So from uh, max step, the risk of bleeding uh, when not given prophylaxis is about one thousand seven hundred per 100,000 infants, which is one of 59 babies. However, when we give prophylaxis, which is vitamin K, the risk is only one per 100,000 units. That's why it's very important to give prophylaxis of vitamin K during birth. So classification. So vitamin K deficiency bleeding, we can classify into early onset, classic onset, and late onset. It based on the uh, uh, lifetime. Lah. So for early onset disease, they will be 0 to 24 hours. Uh, classic onset, 2 to 7 days, the first week of life. Late onset, 
after first week until six months. And this is the common site of the uh, bleeding. For what we are afraid um, for early onset is it involves the intracranial uh, bleeding. And then that's the other common sites. Okay. Okay, for the etiology. So basically, I divide into uh, fetal, maternal, and also both factors. So for the fetal factors, the first uh, factors will be prematurity because when prematurity, there will be low vitamin K. When low vitamin K, we'll expose to vitamin K bleeding deficiency, bleed deficiency bleeding. And also, neonatal liver and also have low vitamin K storage at that time. So also predisposed to hemorrhage. Uh, for uh, uh, vitamin K deficiency bleeding. And also, as I said before, steroid and fatal gut. So there will be no bacteria growth during that time. There will be no vitamin K production. And also other things which is most uh, at late onset, which is malabsorption of vitamin K. For example, bilateral atresia, cystic fibrosis, and also hepatitis. For maternal factor, uh, exclusive breastfeeding is so uh, disadvantage because they have lack of vitamin K. However, uh, this can be countered by giving prophylaxis vitamin K later. And then maternal medications, let's say I said before, were free, some anticonvulsive drugs such as carbamazepine and antimicrobial drug. Uh, most important is, is anti-TB, rifampicin. And also the both factor, they during uh, during uh, fetal part, uh, they will be limited trans placenta transfer of vitamin K and also if the mother have inherited coagulopathy. So for the clinical features, for uh, the history part is very important because what you need to take from the maternal history, you should confirm what the medication used uh, during the pregnancy, if there any is our for usage or also antibiotics and also anticonvulsive. And then for fetal history, uh, you must ask if the baby has vitamin K prophylaxis taken uh, at birth, because if not taken, they will be predisposed to uh, vitamin K deficiency bleeding, any antibiotics, exclusive breastfeeding, and also diarrhea, diarrhea because of malabsorption of vitamin K. For physical examination, usually uh, vitamin K deficiency bleeding, uh, no signs of bleeding. However, if in moderate and severe case, there will be sign of soft tissue hemorrhage such as ecchymosis, like you can see in the slide, and also uh, and then sign of intracranial hemorrhage. We we can see through if the baby have a uh, bulging fontanelle or any neonatal seizure or apnea. So the other differential diagnosis you may consider, first is uh, DIVC, the intravascular coagulation, hepatobiliary disease, uh, neonatal thrombocytopenia that had been explained by uh, Alia, and also hereditary bleeding disorder, for example, uh, von Willebrand disease. Okay. For management part, for the investigation, uh, the most important thing is coagulation profile. What we need to know is prothrombin time and also INR. There will be increase in prothrombin time uh, in factor two. Uh, and, and also, uh, must, we must remember how to differentiate between the neonatal thrombocytopenia. The platelet in this uh, vitamin K deficiency bleeding will be normal. And when we give vitamin, when after the bleeding, we give the vitamin K, usually the prothrombin time will be uh, normal bad. And then for neuroimaging, if we suspect uh, any intracranial hemorrhage uh, for the newborn. Okay, next. For the treatment, I will divide into early onset and late onset. So basically the treatment is only uh, give immediate IV vitamin K, uh, whether one or two milligram. And if the bleeding is severe, we can give 10 to 15 milli, uh, milliliter of kilogram of fresh frozen plasma. And then uh, for class A onset, LN onset, you also use exogenous vitamin K therapy with the IV or oral. And we must remember not to give IV because intramuscular can cause uh, hematoma at the injection site. Will, uh, will cause more severe uh, bleeding. Lah. 
and folate onset, they will be associated with other underlying causes. So we must treat the underlying causes as well. Uh, Amirun, I will stop you. So yeah? here, uh, whatever type, early onset or classic onset or late onset, if they ask you in the exam, mm -hmm. if you see baby bleeding, what mm -hmm. will you give? The answer is fresh frozen plasma. The reason, yes. because uh, vitamin K will take some time to work. So once the bleeding is there, we have to give fresh frozen plasma oh. in either type. Okay. Or oh, immediately fresh frozen plasma. Yes, always, in all types. Once there is bleeding, don't wait, give fresh frozen plasma. Because fresh okay. frozen plasma will provide the factors immediately. Vitamin K takes time. Takes time mm -hmm. to work. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, so basically, the uh, for for this disease, the best management is prevention, which is I intramuscular vitamin K one, uh, K during uh, one milligram at birth. Okay. For the complications, so first of all, what we offer is intracranial hemorrhage. Next is hepatic adrenal gland hemorrhage and also complication of our treatment itself, whether during IV, there will be anaphylactic like reactions. There will be uh, when given high dose of vitamin K can induce hyperbilirubinemia or hemolytic anemia. And also if we I give IMs, can cause hematoma. So prognosis for uh, vitamin K deficiency bleeding, it depends on the amount of blood loss bleeding site and also gestational age. So uh, in absence of intracranial hemorrhage, the prognosis uh, is good, excellence. But in prison of intracranial hemorrhage, the prognosis depends on the extent and location of hemorrhage. So uh, in intracranial hemorrhage, is we must be aware of any motor or neurological deficit uh, later uh, onset of the time. And most of uh, and also in intracranial hemorrhage, the mortality rate also increased. Okay, so that's all from me. This is uh, my summarized table that I get from Nelson that summarized all my presentation. I think that's all. This is my reference. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Amirun. <laughs> Any question to Amirun? Uh, uh, yes, I have a question. I might miss yes. some point. Can you repeat why um, prematurity uh, can be caused?